I'm gonna be like preparing food for tomorrow and stuff, but let me know if my speaker gets loud. Yeah, no worries. Or if my mic gets loud. Our 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 twelve viewers can tolerate your cooking maybe. Sure. <laughs> I think right now there's something coming from from Jens that's uh making it hard to hear Zach sometimes, but I'm not totally positive about that. That, that could be something coming from sure. mine? I think so. Every once in a while it shows up like highlighted when you're not saying something, but what does it sound like? Just like crinkling. So just oh. microphone. It it could be for mine, not for all I know. But oh shit! I'm sorry. I'll try to be more uh, stringent about turning it off. I don't know. I'm not getting anything on my end, really. Okay, uh, I, it could like, be mine. A couple of clicks here and there, but whatever. I'm pretty used to that. Uh, yeah. So let's try and since it's been a couple of weeks, I'll do a quick refresher test of my ability because I'm a little fussy on some stuff too, but uh, when we left off, you guys had just uh, that one I heard. Uh, yeah, that was, that, that was my my phone falling because I went to go try to plug something in and forgot it was here. Hold on, I'm, go I'm going off mic. All good. Um, yeah, so you guys had gotten done exploring uh, an area of uh the deep gnome, deep gnome city, uh, Lingdenstone, where you had discovered that there was in fact a Medusa hiding in some of the abandoned caverns, uh, and been terrorizing their search party and their exploratory party. And, uh, Vanadia was able to take the beast's head off and put it into a bag without any of you being turned to stone, which is miraculous. Um... And you would return victorious, kind of, to the, uh, the, we'll say, de facto leaders of this small kind of settlement. And, uh, you had been offered a choice. You could either kind of take the A train out of town, or you could stick around and see what the plans of this kind of shadowy, nefarious Pudding King figure was. Uh, he was a man, or a gnome that had lived about town that uh, had been deemed kind of rather mad and uh, had been seen talking to rotten foodstuffs and hiding himself away. He, he was usually just clothed in like rags and uh, he had taken to calling himself the Pudding King and he often spoke of uh, his beautiful lord's uh, ultimate digestion. So all in all, this guy's kind of a weirdo creep. Um... And it's up to you guys. The, the gnomes are more than willing to send you with uh, some scouts to lead you back towards the Dorvan settlement of Gontalgrim, the fastest route out. Um, they pretty much have, like, a minecart set up that'll, you know, fast travel you guys there. Um, or if you guys want, you are free to stick around and help them settle their differences. This guy. Yeah, I think all the kind of ghostliness around has Maggie wanting to help help these people do some, I don't know, find some peace. And uh, I think the last time they had told us that the Pudding King looked like he was massing forces. So I think where we left off, we were kind of interested in checking that out. I think we were planning on just taking care of everything, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that seems to be my recollection of things too. But I didn't want to—I uh, didn't want to put words in your guys' mouth. Um, but that's really fortunate because the map that you're currently on happens to be the lair of the Pudding King, where you guys have found yourselves after a brief travel through the uh, outer reaches of Lingdenstone. Um, you were given access via one of the large kind of steel doors that were uh, put in place to cut off all these creatures that were coming in. And you now stand in a large cavern. Uh, and before you is a sort of bubbling, fetid pool. All around you, uh, there are mobile, just disgusting puddles of what looks essentially like living jello. 
Um, some of them green, some of them black, a few of them ochre. I know this is closer to red than it is ochre, but I didn't feel like looking up the color settings for ochre. Um, and it is no sooner than you have entered that you hear a voice from somewhere off in the stony darkness, the shadows uh, in the back of this cavern. Crying out. So, you have come for judgment in the court of the Pudding King, have you? Yeah. And all the echoes are very disorienting. Try as you might, you do not seem to see any sign of life or movement anywhere. You can't really locate where the voice is coming from. You do, however, see over here on this side, a very large chair. Stands maybe 20 feet tall. Looks like it's fit for a giant. And leaning up against it is a small ladder. Do the Eye of Agos, does uh, any, any, of, any of the above look hostile? Um, so, you can't really tell just by looking at these things whether they're hostile or not. They don't uh, they immediately do not appear to be, like, threatening you or coming towards you in any way. They're sort of just meandering around, like, just blah, 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 like, back and forth. Um, you're not really sure if these things have any sort of sentience to them, or if they are literally just mindless kind of blob walker things. Uh, you can get some stats, though, if you would like to look up ochre jelly, black pudding, um, and where for green slime, I forget, green slime is actually an environmental effect in D&D, so it's like a literal just puddle of not living stuff. But we're going to call it a green slime on here. And it's actually going to be the stats for a gelatinous cube. So all of the same effects are possible from a green slime as a gelatinous cube. That's all. We're just going to reskin it. Because I discovered that while I was prepping stuff today. and was like, wait a minute. I have these cool green slime tokens and I can't use them for a green slime. That's dumb. So I'm just left with this green slime. What would you guys, how would you guys like to approach this situation? Obviously, the Pudding King is aware of your presence. And other than that, you are, you know, free to kind of move about this cavern and explore as you would like to. Do we want to try talking first, or? I think so. Um, yeah, maybe you'll cast thaumaturgy and yell out to him. Greetings, friend. Uh, you seem to have some sort of scrying magic. It's impressive. It's not my magic, he says. It's my lord's. Maggie who, is, says, who is your lord? We might serve the same master. Ah. Do you have his hunger? Do you wish to devour all as he does? Well... We are quite hungry. We haven't eaten today. I could eat. Ah. Yes, please. Come over by my throne. You will have a feast. You shall see. And again, this echo is kind of just all around. It's like, you know, this is some amazing Foley work right now. Do we, do we have eyes on the Pudding King anywhere? Or? So far, you have not seen a single clue of where he could be. Like, there's been no okay. movement over by the rocks or anywhere in this cavern. Kohan, does your... That sense thing you do, would that be able to sense where he is? Uh, it takes ten minutes. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of scoping we could do. I would bet the... Gnome King is at the top of this ladder onto a throne. Um, um, now he says, if your lord wishes to consume everything, does that include us? He wishes to consume all. We shall rejoice at his consumption, for then we shall be a part of our board. Well, we'll stay over here uh, 
we're not ready to be consumed at the moment. Ah, you have more faith to give. More meals to consume to show your devoutness. That is good. Please, I beg, I beg of you, come and eat, eat more. Uh, as he says this, a small light kind of appears, just floating near the throne, maybe like five, ten feet away from it. And you can see, surrounding this throne, uh, on the ground near the rocks, is just piles of refuse, what you would look at of being like someone's compost heap, essentially, like apple cores and banana peels and things of that nature. Um, rotting meats. He says, See, I have prepared a feast for all of my guests. <coughs> Aranith looks around in distaste. Now he says, What kind of creature are you? I am what he would have me be. Till I am no more. And who is your lord? My lord, the great, the powerful devourer, Jubilex. Hear me speak his name and shudder with fear. Does yeah, Jubilex mean anything to you guys, or...? Uh, Can Maggie do, like, a religion check? Yeah, sure. absolutely. She doesn't have much of a advantage on religion, but I'll try oh, it. I thought, I thought you did. I'm sorry. She's more of a kitchen table cleric. Now, if you want medicine checked... That she can do. Alright, let's see. Twelve altogether. Um, you are fairly certain that Jubilex is the name of one of the demon lords, some you know, someone who is in the same circle of uh like deities as Orcus or uh Inogu or uh, Baphomet, these these names that you've heard before in reference to the uh, the the demon lords that are constantly invading hell uh, and fighting with the devils. Um, these are like the big wigs, um, and Jubilex is somewhere in their ranks. You you don't quite remember what he's like the demon lord of. Like you know you remember that all the demons kind of have like a theme. Like each demon is like the demon of something. You just can't place. You can't remember exactly what. Jubilex is the demon lord of. I ask Darianth, uh, do you think it might be worth asking about the Wand of Orcus? I assume you did that on our, our mental channel? Right. Damn. Um, <laughs> Baroness doesn't think it's a good idea. <clears throat> she says... Do you think there might be a if if we can? Do you think you might know about it? And is where is it worth trying to get that information from him? Aaron says no. All right. Well, now he's fed up with the rotting food. Um, and suggests to the group that they approach, but let him know that they will not tolerate any motion towards them. All right, then. Erin uh, flies up about 20 feet above the ground away from the slime because she just finds this all very gross and distasteful. Now he says, friend, we'll approach the throne. Uh, we will not tolerate any motion towards us. Is there any response? Uh, yes. Wait, give me just one second after I roll. Uh, 
Um, by the way, one thing while they were back in town, Maggie would have we did inspiring leader, so everyone should have seventeen hit points, uh, temporary hit points. Did we have a, f a long rest? No. Okay. Um, I thought we were going to, but yeah. We were going to. Yeah, after we got done with the Medusa, I thought we we're gonna go do a long rest after. Oh, my memory yeah, was that. I think you guys did do a long rest for the, the night okay. before you set out. All right. So, cool. Um, Dave, have Maggie roll me a persuasion check uh, with a DC of 18. Uh, well, 19. Okay. Um, this is, but of course... You are welcome guests here at the Court of the Pudding King. And uh, as you all begin to move forward, uh, these slimes all around you begin to sort of move up and out of the way, uh, allowing you to make your way to your direction you want to. They all kind of safe up here onto this wall. They're all just wobbling around there. Um, Sorry, my mouse is acting up. So yeah, as you guys approach, they're all kind of moving away from you. Um, and this light kind of start begins to shift now, uh, up over, kind of to the right here. Screen. For you appears this uh, small, naked, deep gnome, uh, clothed only in literally like just this nasty stained loincloth, and he's uh, he's got this staff that appears to have like a chunk of rotting flesh on it or something at the top of it. It's something that he keeps picking at and nibbling at it. And, uh, he calls out to you in between taking little bites. So then, are you coming to feast? Are you coming to feast in the name of Jubilex? Now he says, are you, are you a cleric of Jubilex? I am the voice of Jubilex. I speak for these who cannot speak for themselves. And he points around all the slimes all right. that are wobbling around. In my mind, these things, I don't know if you guys have seen Hotel Transylvania, but they look like the blob from that thing. From that. They're all very jovial. Hey, Zach, can I do an insight check on uh, this uh, guy's intentions? Yeah, uh, what are you trying to discern? Basically, uh, what his ultimate plan for us is. Like, if, if he had, if he, if he's if he truly is being welcoming or if he has a malevolent intent. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And, go ahead and roll me in sight. Thirteen. Uh, you think that this guy is mad as a goddamn hatter. You think that he is not without some truth it seems like he can in fact control these slimes to some extent or it's a real weird coincidence that when he told you that you would be safe that they all moved out of the way but as far as his uh intentions towards you as a group you're pretty sure that whatever he worships is probably not a good deity being that it's a nasty demon lord and that when he says that it's he wants it to devour all he's being sincere about that all right well I, I relay what little information I green through through the uh, mental channel to the rest of the party. Okay. Uh, I, I think back uh, um, 
I don't know if she can hear me or not, but I'm just curious if that staff that he's holding is the thing that's controlling the slimes. Oh yeah, we can all t we can all talk on the uh, mental channel. If, what was it you were asking? If uh, the staff he's holding is the thing that controls the slimes. I mentally ask Reggie what he thinks. And, and tell him to speak through the mental channel. Reggie says, I can't be certain. It could be the staff. It could be some other magic that he has. Or, uh, it could be something entirely different. Something, uh, darkly akin to the way that this Maggie here gets her powers through sheer force of worship. He may in Can fact I be do... a cleric of this Jubilex. Can I do an arcana check on the staff? Uh, yeah, you can do that to discern if you have any sense that it's a magical object. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, sorry. And just just as a note, this is not the same as like a detect magic spell or detect magic item. Um, that would give you like more specific information on it. This is more like uh, you've got a pretty good idea that that's a magic item. You know what I mean? If if you pass the check. Uh, sixteen. Yeah. Uh, you you do have the feeling the way that he's like playing around with this thing that it may in fact be at least a uh some sort of a uh, thing that he uses for his powers. You know, like, much the way that you, spell uh... focus. Yeah, spell focus, exactly. I relay that information again through the uh, mental channel to everybody. <clears throat> um, when he, uh, asks if they're there to feed with Jubilex, um, Maggie says, friend, I too am a cleric. My, my lady... Uh, <clears throat> is the goddess of the hearth, and therefore all who feed those around them are uh, with her, and, and we feast in her honor. Fellow divine spirit. Yes, come closer that we may examine each other's proprietariness. Uh, I go close to him. Okay, so you guys are going around the circle here, going over towards where he's standing. Yeah. What is the Eye of Argos at this point giving us information on him? Uh, it just gives you basic stats for a deep gnome. Uh, he's not super tough. He's got a... Right now, he has an armor class of 16, and it's got a little, like, aura that says mage armor. It's floating around his head. Um, 49 hit points and a speed of 30 foot. You know, uh, pretty basic deep dome stats. Uh, it does, however, have a flashing warning that says innate spell casting. So, innate spell, that's similar to, like, your sorceress powers, uh, Arianth. It's, mm -hmm. he has something similar to that, where he can just kind of cast certain spells at will. Can I prepare a spell such that, like, if he does anything, you know what I mean? Like, like ready in action with a spell? Yeah, absolutely. Great. All right. I'm going to do that with Firestorm on him and uh, all of the all the uh, slimes and stuff around us for, I mean, 10, 10, 10 foot cubes. So as much as that can cover. Well, they're spread out pretty good. They're all... I mean, the little, I don't know if you guys can see the graph lines on there, but they're all spread out to probably 10 feet apart anyways. So oh, those... Okay, so it's not like a million oozes, slimes. They're they're just like... It's it's where they are on that fountain Yeah, thing. like for like for what you see right now, these are like these big blob slime things that are kind of moving around independently of each other. It's not like all slime everywhere. <laughs> But the, this uh, this center area here does kind of like the water is real gross and slimy looking too. So yeah, no telling so, what's on there. So basically, it would start on start on the gnome, 
you know, follow him to the pool and then kind of like make two semicircles around the pool, if that makes sense. Okay. Gotcha. Um, hey, Zach? Yes. Sorry, I, I just wanted to say I'm going to uh, ready a, a third level counter spell if he, if he makes any motion to do a spell at any point. Okay. All right, so Tuan, you're moving over by him. Is everybody else moving over towards him as well? Yeah, I'm he's cautiously following kind of behind Tohan. Adrian's definitely following behind. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that guy. He's he's just quietly just plodding along all wide-eyed, like, man, this is crazy. Arianth, you're you're flying up above everything here, right? Yeah, I'm I'm not getting within 50 feet of him. I'll, 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 I should say, I'll fly within like up to about 50 feet of him okay. but that's about as close as I'm getting oh I'm getting close to him alright so Tohan you're walking right up to him yeah alright putting queef here's the thing <laughs> it's like you need to leave Blinding Stone alone or we're gonna fuck you up the, uh, the Pudding King kind of looked shocked for a moment and then he puts his hands on his hips and leans his head back and begins laughing hysterically, just... <laughs> oh, yes, excellent. Those silly... Uh, those silly gnomes, they don't know what they're missing out on. I offered for them to feast, and they wouldn't come here and feast with me. Do you know why? They said it's I'm gonna, so rotten. I'm going to rage while he's, doing, while he's talking <laughs> and, and, and try to grab the staff out of his hand. Okay, uh, everybody roll initiative. What? <laughs> mm, I'm gonna re roll that. Nice. Nineteen. I got an eight. I got a seventeen. Eighty. Uh, she just let me roll away from this uh, counters page for her. Hey, Zach, what, what creature did you say to look up again to get the uh, stats for the slime things? Um, so it is Black Pudding is one of them. Um, Gelatinous Cube, it, we're just going to use the green ones on the board. So, so just I could even rename these all the Gelatinous Cube if that makes it easier. Um, okay, thanks. And Ochre Jelly. So it's O-C-H-R-E Jelly. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like Maggie, you are going to be up first. Did we catch the end of his sentence about what happened when he invited Bling Stone? No, he bit, like, Tohan pretty much cut him off. And, I mean, does so he looks like he's about to attack us when the, when the staff is... Yeah. Grabbed. Oh, um, Tohan, for trying to grab the staff, uh, trying to grab that staff, uh, just roll me a standard attack roll, I guess, like, a unarmed, unarmed strike. Okay. To see if you can grab it. I'm not gonna make you roll for strength to see if you can grab it away from him, because he's a weak-ass. 25. Boy. Yeah, so you, you just snatched this thing right out of his hand. Um, now roll me a constitution saving throw. Twenty-five. 
24. Okay. Um, you do not lose any hit points. Uh, but you feel like this... It's like when you grab, like, a low-voltage uh, source of electricity. Like, it's a pretty pretty gnarly tingle. Like, sort of, that, that runs all the way up through that metal arm of yours. But then it just stops. Like, kind of somewhere's in that metal arm. It doesn't make it all the way to your body. Um, and eventually the feeling kind of fades away. And you're just left holding this stick, which you now realize is actually a... Uh, it's a long bone of some sort, not a stick, and this bone is actually grown up and around what appears to be a skull, and the skull still actually has flesh on it that this guy's been chewing on. It's not really discernible if it's of a specific uh, race or not, it just seems like a very comical, like, almost as if somebody, like, drew a skull to make it look like a skull with meat hanging off from it. Uh, and yeah, so you you are in possession of the staff as initiative starts. That was so freaking So Maggie, what would you like to do? Um, <clears throat> so bless Tohan, Venadia, and herself, and uh, what's his name? She can't reach. Adrian, yeah. uh, I don't think she can reach Ariana unless she's thirty feet away from her. Uh she's like twenty I'm... feet above you. Okay, so. Bless them all. Um, <clears throat> so everybody gets plus four on attack rolls and oops, uh, attack rolls and saving throws. Um, gets a d4. Oh, nice. And then uh, she'll cast the cast the spiritual weapon and toss it at the nearest slime. Okay. Or actually, no. She'll uh, well. Yeah, she'll throw it at the nearest slime. She has to see that this guy's going to attack to believe it. Not that it's not very likely. <clears throat> um, so. Uh, 28 to hit. And 13 bludgeoning damage. Twenty-eight is definitely going to hit. It's not have resistance to bludgeoning damage, surprisingly. Or I mean, it's force damage, I guess, because it's a spell. Either way, you get slashing damage. I'm going to do you get piercing damage as well. It's an odd stat block. On the back of the site. Uh, how much damage did you say it was? 13. 13. Okay. And does that conclude your turn? Uh, yeah. If there are um, slimes that look like they could approach her, she'll kind of back up away from them. There definitely are slimes within like 20, 30 feet of you. Um, so this here is all essentially a solid rock wall um, and or rubble of a, of walls, like kind of a cave-in. Um, so which direction would you like to move to get away from the slime? Do you want to go more towards the throne or farther up into the corner here? That corner is like an exit from the cave, is that right? Uh, no, it's just poorly, just poorly, uh, filled in. It's basically supposed gotcha. to be, like, solid wall all the way around there. Uh, I guess it's towards the throne. Like the throne. And at the ready. Alright. Uh, that particular ochre jelly that attacked you, or that you attacked, that is. Only has a speed of 10 foot. Unfortunate for it. Claw. It's not going to be able to reach very often. She's going to yell to Adrian, too, to get out of their range. Don't, don't get near them. All that is 
is able to do is just shamble towards you. It is now Vanidia's turn. Uh, my assumption is... Uh, I'm thinking Vanidia would probably use some fire stuff. Nick, are you still going to run Vanidia is today? Is one, yeah, is one of you guys going to run it? That would be... Um, I, I could. I mean, I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared for this, so... For some reason, I, I thought we were saying that Vanidia was kind of like staying back or something. Yeah, I think last week Nick said he'd be down with you um, playing Vanidia. Uh, yeah, Vinny's gonna pull out a uh, the Staff of Fire, I guess. That's fun. And use four charges of it and create a wall of fire. Nice. Sixty feet long, twenty feet high, one foot thick. So I guess uh, Vinny is going to kind of create like a sixty foot ring around uh, between us and the pudding king and the and the rest of the puddings here. Something kind of like that would be. Perfect. Ooh. Fancy, right? Yeah, fancy. Fire. And if any, uh, if any puddings try to cross it, they're going to take 5d8 fire damage. All right. And uh, this ochre jelly is actually kind of in it right now. Does that, so that takes effect on the beginning of its turn, or is it when the spell is cast as well? You create a wall of fire on solid surface. When a wall appears, each creature within its area must make a dex saving throw. On a failed save, the creature takes 5d8, I think. So, uh, DC 13 dex save. Okay, it got a 4. <laughs> 6 so. minus 2. Alright, uh, what was the damage on it? Hold on, I screwed up. Sixteen fire damage. Sixteen. Okay. This thing is now um I would say very bloody, but I don't feel like that's appropriate, so I guess very crispy. <laughs> it's very oozy. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Bubbly. Yeah, yeah, literally it's just it's starting to boil. Okay. Um does Vanadia want to do anything else? Uh, as a bonus action, she'll cast, um, Hunter's Mark on the closest one. Okay. Uh, the one that's already damaged or the next closest one? Uh, let's say the next closest one. Mark. And any movement? Um, yeah, okay, I'll show back up more towards the throne, too. Next up is Tohan. Well, Tohan seeing this big bloody head on top of a, on top of a fucking uh, big bone here. 
uh, realize this guy's pretty fucking evil, so he's just gonna uh, attack the shit out of him with a dwarven thrower. Uh, recklessly Greek weapon master. I guess he'll just like take the bone staff and just like kind of like shove it behind him in his pack. And uh, uh, attack him recklessly, great webmaster. All right. Uh, yeah, that's a uh, twenty-eight to hit. Oh yeah. Okay, I'm gonna use the second one here. So that is thirty-two damage on the first hit. Okay. He is already bloodied. And that's a natural 20. Uh, and I have... In, we're level 13 now, so I have... Two Brutal Criticals, so I get to roll 3d10 plus 9 here. Plus another 10. Not great. Uh, so nine plus nine plus is eighteen. Plus another three for rage is twenty-one plus ten, so that's thirty-one more damage. So sixty-five total. All right. So on your first hit, you cut his whole front like open, and it begins to kind of go out and like apart, kind of like a like a pulling an accordion apart, and. Uh, as this is happening, instead of blood and guts coming out, he is just more of this gelatinous ooze, what these other creatures are made out of, coming from inside of him now. And uh, it begins to kind of gnarl and swirl. And the second hit, you're like, ugh! And you just smash him completely flat with the axe, sending this goo out in every direction. Like it just pancake flops all over the place. It's all over the throne. Uh, so, as this, uh, as you smash this Pudding King to bits, the very room itself begins to sort of rumble and thunder. And you hear, <laughs> you hear a voice very much like the Pudding King's, but now it is darker, more ominous, more deep and full, and is as it speaks it is literally shaking rocks and loose like uh kind of stuff is falling down all around you it says jubilex's voice will not be taken away so easily and uh the pit behind you begins to rumble and shake and the water is sloshing the bricks are breaking and water's falling out slime more slimes are coming up and now all these slimes are starting to crawl away from this yeah. Growing from this uh, pool is just this nasty putrescent, disgusting, like, kind of grayish blob that is apparently an amalgam of uh, all of these these creatures together, sort of just writhing, spinning around in circles. And uh, it begins slamming the water with its pseudopods, splashing this muck up everywhere. Uh, and as it does, a large wave comes up over the front and puts out a wall of fire. Now these smaller put, uh, puddings and things are starting to kind of slowly creep their way around. They've been kind of creeping around. No more naked wizard. What would you guys like to do? Are we still in initiative? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Does the Eye of Agos tell uh, Maggie anything? 
about the, this new arrival? Uh, yeah, it's under its name slot. It says BFS. <laughs> Big fucking slime. Um, so this uh, this slime essentially is just a big ball of hit points, and it has the same stats as a gelatinous cube, a black pudding, and an ochre jelly, all rolled into one. Like, as far as the, uh, like, pick the highest stat, and that's what it's going to use. Also, it's got all of their abilities, and it's like 100 feet wide. Nice. You guys are pretty back to your backs to the wall right now, too. There's not really an exit from this side of the cavern. It's sort of you're sort of in a box canyon type deal over here. Who's up? Yeah, who's it? Who's up oh, next? Sorry. Uh, we had the Tohan, and I have anything left in his turn. Uh, well, that was just his first attack, uh, or first and second attack with Great Weapon Master, and he did kill somebody, so I believe he's got another attack. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll take the Dwarven Thrower and throw it. It's got a range of 60 feet. Okay, yeah, this thing's about 50 feet away from here, so 50, 55 feet. I'm assuming you're throwing at the big thing, or you can get one of these guys. Yeah, 25 to hit. 25 hits. So this only does 1d8 plus 9, uh, so 13 damage. I don't know. If... No, it only counts as melee attacks for reach bonuses and stuff. It's 13 damage. Okay. And the uh, the Dwarven Thrower, I believe, flies back to your hand when you're all done, yep. right? Um, so yeah, this thing, it, like, I picture this this big sledgehammer thing comes flying out, and it hits the slime, and it's sort of like if you flick the jello mold really hard. It just goes flink and, like, breaks in, then the brake sort of just slaps back together. It's a little wobbly there for a second, but the hammer skips up off the top and comes flying back to you. All right, um, up. After that, any movement, Dawn? Yeah, I guess I'll uh, move up toward uh, uh, the big boy there. Um, right, to, probably to right to the rim of the thing. Yeah, maybe, maybe so. I'm not quite in the water, but on my next turn, I can can I at least see like how deep this water is. Or yeah, it looks like it's only about a foot deep. It looks like this was some sort of big, like, cistern or something that they would, you know, when they, this was a fully functioning city, that maybe they had some sort of a water feature here, and it has clearly been uh, corrupted by this, all these okay. slimes. Uh, so let's see, up next is going to be uh, one of these black puddings. Inch closer again. I'm actually going to take this now. Uh, Arianth. Alrighty, um... Basically all, um... basically all that happens from these guys is that they move up 10 feet on their turn. Just moving them now to get ahead of the game. This, uh, Ogre Jelly here is going to take, I'm assuming... Oh no, he's out of the, he's out of the fire now, so he's okay. Yeah, so that's, I think that's it. Here we go, it's going to be your turn. Alright. Sorry, give me one quick second here. I'm going to, uh... Sorry, one second. Never mind that. I'm sorry, I need one quick second. Okay. What I was going to do is not. Alright, actually, you know what? 
I'm gonna take a uh, page from Valadia there, Valadia rather, and uh, use my uh, staff of fire and cast fireball. What well, actually? Uh, can I cast? Where the hell is it? There it is. Um. Is, any, is there a way for me to aim fireball in a way so that it doesn't uh, hit anybody who's near it? Uh, depends on what you mean. It's uh, each creature with in a twenty foot radius spear centered on that point must make a dexterity saving throw. Yeah, so as long as as long as you are twenty twenty one feet away centering it, they will not be hit by it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I just want to center it so that it it uh hits uh the the big the big ooze. Oh yeah, you're, you you got plenty of room. Nothing else is really around this thing. This thing's still just massing itself together. And you notice like some of the like the water level is going down as you're uh as you're watching this thing get bigger. Um so yeah, you're going to fireball it? Yeah. Okay. Do it to it. Uh what is it deck saving throw for me? Uh yes, 17. Let's see, who's got the highest dex saving throw? Not uh, you, not you. I don't know if you know this about oozes and slimes. They are not dexterous, nor are they fast. I kind of thought that would be the case. <laughs> they're not charismatic either. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Actually, they're minuses all the way across the board, pretty much. He did, however, get a natural 20, which gives him an 18 as his saving throw. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's got minus two, so but he got a nat twenty. Uh... Mother, well, I guess he passes that then, doesn't he? Still, so, so amorphous. It's still, uh, it's still half it damage. It takes right? half damage. Yeah, he still takes half damage. So, all right, hold on, let me roll for half damage here. That's one lucky freaking slime. Twenty-five. So half of that would be uh, what twelve? Like twelve, yeah. Okay. So yeah, same thing, like there's like a bubbling and fizzling on the edge of this uh, thing when your fireball hits it, but half the fireball just literally bounces off and crashes into the roof, bringing down more like stone and little shards of things. So does he take the damage from it or no? Yeah, he, he took the half damage. That was just his, uh, his, his dexterity just involved him kind of making a little like shoulder wave, you know? Gotcha. Um, any other actions? Um, as a bonus action, I will uh, give Bardic Inspiration to whoever's next in the lineup. Okay, yeah, that would be Maggie. Or, I'm sorry, what that would, boy, actually, Adrian didn't do it would that actually thing? be Adrian, yeah. I didn't well, next, well, I always, next I, in my party. I never forget to include him. Or I always forget to include him in the uh, yeah. encounters. So, <laughs> oh, that yeah. guy's still alive? <laughs> yeah, he's just hanging out. Yeah. Wow. He's as bad as Todd. Boy Toy doesn't get get uh, inspiration. Uh, I, that'll go to Maggie. Okay. Um, Adrian, at this point, is still hanging out over here. I think he's going to run over and try and kill this thing. Hmm. Oh man! Now, if she sees him start to move, she'll yell, "Raiden strap is only." Oh no, he's in it. He's in it to win. <laughs> he's right up on this thing. Oh boy! She's like, "I can save your other friends now. Don't make me save you too." Plus three. Uh, 20. He rolled a nat 20 to hit, so he hits this thing. But he's actually a multi-attacker, too. So that's going to be 20 damage on this thing. It actually kills it, because that was the one that was already damaged by fire and stuff. Um, wait, slashing damage. It's resistant to slashing damage. It's only going to be half that, so it's 6, so it doesn't kill it. Ha! Ah. Um, he's gonna make a second attack. 
thing at plus three. That would only be a six, so he misses on his second attack. So he's like, ha, foul beast! Slashes it, and it just kind of goes, moves out of the way. It's like, what? Uh, up next is going to be Maggie. All right, she's going to... Um, all right, so... None of the slimes have been killed yet, is that right? Uh, no, one of them looks like it's just about dead, this ochre jelly here. Okay. Uh, the rest of them are just plodding along at a 10 feet per round. She's going to try to finish that <laughs> one off with the pan. So that is... 26 to hit, and 16 force damage. Okay, that definitely kills him. So it's, she smashes the last little bit. Adrian looks at the pan and nods, like, solemnly. <laughs> Gives it, like, the, the, the fist pump. Like, yeah, pan. <laughs> Not, doesn't acknowledge that it's you doing it. He looks right at the pan. Yeah. Appropriate. Yeah, uh, your boyfriend's dumb. <laughs> Uh, and then who, it's Vanadia after Maggie, right? Uh, yep. Um, well, nobody really needs advantage on this guy. Um, <clears throat> do we need a celestial as well, I guess? Um... Yeah, I'll summon a celestial. Why not? Um, <clears throat> it's gonna be a. Uh, um, I'll make it the ranged one, the Avenger. So she casts. She uh, summons a Avenger. Probably like forty feet out from the. I don't know. Um, is the center of the pool like forty feet in or twenty feet in or what's? Uh, yeah, it's the center of the pool, directly over the top of the middle of this thing, would be like maybe fifty feet. Okay, actually, you know what? I take it back. I, f I forgot that this is also a concentration spell. Yeah, it's the pool um, has a diameter of about eighty feet. I also forgot we should all be getting uh, adding a D4 to our attack and saving throws. Um, That's right. So we'll leave the bless on and um, let's see if my toll of the dead is any higher. Um, yeah, she'll hit the big slime with toll of the dead. Uh, I was in saving 18. That is going to hit, yep. And... Uh, 10 necrotic damage. Okay. Celestial. Oh, you said you are not doing the Celestial this turn, right? Yeah, because... I don't know. Plus, it's probably not that useful, but I don't know what the gnome guy was going to do, so I'll just hold the concentration on that. Alright, so the slime is taking him damage. Um, anything else? That's it. motion. The slimes are moving. Start to wrap. All right. It is now Vanadia's turn. Um, okay. Vanadia is going to use her movement to get on top of this giant drone thing. No, the, the throne. The thing with the ladder. Oh, okay. <laughs> and fall. Uh, and then she's going to use three charges of the fire staff 
and center it right on the uh, green jelly over on the left hand here. So it should hit all four of those. Excellent. And as this is happening, like your your soundtrack, just you, you can just barely hear the lyrics too, but it's little pigs, little pigs, let me in. Yeah, yeah. green jelly reference. So that's another DC 13 deck save for all four of them. Jellies rolled 16s. Plants cubes. Also rolled 16 on a net 20. Kids were baby bad. So 31 if they fail, 15 if they pass. Oh, what was the DC on it again? 13. Okay, so that's they all pass. They all take half. Uh, right. so they all take 15. Sure. All right, so they're not quite looking bloodied yet, but they're not far off. This large uh, white pudding thing in the middle here begins swirling around now, and uh, almost as if in reaction to Vanadia's attack, uh, lashes out with one of its pseudopods, quick as a whip, uh, the full length, 50 feet out to Venedia, and engulfs her and pulls her into the, uh, the outer edge of this writhing mass of goo and slime. You can still kind of see Venedia, like, it's like this clearish kind of jello consistency around her, but she immediately is like, <gasps> like, you think you've probably got maybe like four or five rounds before... This becomes a real issue for Venadia. Will attacking the slime hurt Venadia? No, there's a large enough surface area you can kind of point away from her. I mean, I, I wouldn't, you. I wouldn't center a fireball on her, but you know, you could, you could point the fireball like the other half of the slime, probably not hurt her. Does, does Vanadia still have a bonus action of any sort, or anything else to do? Does she take any damage from getting sucked in, or not No yet? damage, just grappled right now. Uh, nope. That's it. Okay. Leave. Next is Tohan. Uh, well, seeing, seeing her get sucked into the white giant meringue pie, uh, he's going to go up and start attacking the meringue pie. Excellent. All right, so you are just able to make it to this thing, as this kind of sludgy slime is difficult to rain, but I'm going to say since it's only about a 20-foot span, you probably your movement would probably cover it. Yeah, I got 40 feet movement. Okay, so, so. yeah, you're just able to get there. Um, I'm going to hit it with the Dwarven Thrower, uh, Recklessly, Great Weapon Master. One hit. Yep, that hits. Twenty-seven damage on the first hit. Okay. Oh, uh, I'm gonna use a luck point here. Try to. Uh, fuck. Well, fifteen hit. Do you, you have the you still have bless, so you got a extra D four. Oh, okay. Sixteen to hit. That hits. Hey. Hashtag blessed. <laughs> I'll roll again for fun. All right, so that is twenty eight damage on the second hit. Okay. Um, as soon as these two hits strike it, like the first one, it begins to kind of wobble and shake. And on the second one, uh, almost as if like you've struck something or caused this to happen by striking it, 
Uh, Vanidia is kind of spit out at the thing's feet here. Just, bleh, just plopped out. Stay out of there, Vanidia. It's probably not good in there. She's like, oh, gross. It tastes like pistachio. <laughs> so it's lemon meringue. It is an abomination. Anything else, Johan? Uh, nope. That's, that's all I can do. I don't really have any bonus actions. I already used my movement in action. It's now going to uh, move forward and attack Adrian. Sorry, that's such a light decision. Zach, I'm not sure if you said anything, but I don't think I heard you. Oh, um, sorry, I might have been muttering. Uh, so the gelatinous cube is moving up to attack uh, Adrian. Let's see, so you get, can you guys hear me now? Yep. Okay. Yep. Sorry, sometimes I gotta click back on the Google Meet, I think. Um, so yeah, the, the gelatinous cube moves up to attack Adrian. Uh, hits with a pseudopod. I have to shift back over to it. it does not make contact. Only a 17. Lucky for Adrian, he's in play mail. See if it gets more attack. Nope, no multi attack, so he's good. Press to move up a little bit more. Okay. Ariance, you're up next. Does the Aya Argos tell us what uh, the uh, Big Slime's intelligence level is? Uh, yeah, it sort of is giving you a screwy reading at first, but it kind of goes back and forth a couple of numbers, uh, and then it is sitting there blinking between one and two. Okay, like it's like, it's like a one, and then it's like, think two. Think two. <laughs> Alright, so I am going to use one of my nifty new feats called a Quicken Spell, which allows me to uh, spend two sorcery points and change a casting time to an, a bonus action as opposed to a regular action. I can do that twice per long rest now. Nice. So as a bonus action, I am going to cast Tasha's Mind Whip on the uh, big guy, which is a saving throw of uh, 17, uh, an intelligence saving throw of 17. Right. It's a 14 for a 10. So that's a fail. All right, so he does nine psychic damage, and for its next turn, it must choose whether it gets a move, an action, or a bonus action. It only gets one of the three. Okay, so that's that, and as and for my action. I'm going to use my handy twin spell, and I'm going to uh, cast Firebolt at two of... Are there any damage slimes right now? Uh, there is the one that Maggie damaged down here, the gelatinous cube. Yeah. It's also yeah, marked. I will, uh, all right, I will uh, use... Uh, I will attack that one with a Firebolt, and a uh, one close by to it, whatever one's closest to it with okay. a fireball. So I will, uh, roll attack. Do I, do, do I roll attack twice when I twin a spell, or just once? Uh, I will leave that choice up to you. If you want to make two separate attack rolls, you may, 
or you can just rely on one really good roll. <laughs> Probably in your benefit to make separate ones, I would think, statistically. Yeah, I'll do separate. Okay, so for the first one, got a 17. Okay. And then for the second, a 13. Both okay. hit. These things All are right, not hard so... to hit. Slow moving blobs of jelly. Alright. First one gets 8 damage. Okay. That one is now bloodied. Okay, and the second one. Wait one second. Gets oh, twenty eight damage. Excellent. Uh, that one is also now bloody. It looks like. All right, and that would be my turn. I'm loving these meta magic things. Oh yeah, the, the sorcery stuff. It's, yep. it's like it's really wild. I like it. Really lets you customize how the magic works, which is cool. Like wizards, kind of are more. I don't want to say limited, but they're it's more strict the way that spells can get yeah. cast. Whereas sorcery is regimented. Yeah, sorcery is a little more free form. It's cool. Yeah, it kind of went with the chaotic aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Looks like other than I don't know if they were not, but if, if I did, then sorry. Um, it's going to be Adrian's turn. Adrian is going to swing at one of these bloody guys here. Seventeen. That's gonna hit. Ten damage. Did you add the D four from bless? Uh, I did not. That doesn't apply to damage, right? Just to attack rolls. Attack roll and save. Yeah. Sorry, I, I misheard you. Oh, I forgot to freaking use that. Seven plus D four. I like this dice roller thing. I found this on the uh, workshop. Literally just swap the other dice in there. Over and then see what I have. Nice. One. This. Um, so he hits on the first one, not on the second one. Ten damage. This thing is now very bloodied. And let's see. Change my head on this one. It goes back to Maggie. All right, she's gonna hit that very damaged one with the pan. Oh man, that's a uh, just an eleven. Does that? Oh wait, I didn't add the D four. So thirteen. Sweet. And then thirteen damage. Uh, that one is smashed to bits. Nice. Uh, small, small like contents of the cube are now spilling out onto the floor as the rest of the form kind of breaks away. Like how's how's the uh, big slime looking? Uh, it is not that damaged. All right, it's taken a grand total of about ninety damage. I think I'm kind of mentally keeping track. Um, she'll throw a uh, guiding bolt at it. So that is where is it? Twenty one to hit. Twenty one hits. Yep. And thirty three radiant damage ah radiant damage um so this thing actually suffers a weakness from radiant damage so it nice. takes, yeah, it's going to take double damage on it 66 
uh, as you do that. Uh, Jen, does Tasha's Mind Whip specify anything about um, legendary actions? It doesn't specify. It just basically says you can only choose one action. On its turn, right? Yeah, basically whether okay. you can only move, do an action, or... Uh, sorry, give me one second. So I'm going to assume that a legendary action that can only be performed as a reaction on another creature's turn does not fall under that rule because otherwise my boss sucks. <laughs> <laughs> So as, uh, Maggie, as you do this uh, radiant damage, uh, it seems to immediately shift its focus to you, and a pseudopod launches out at you. Um, give me a dexterity saving throw. Uh, DC is 20. Let's see if you can do it. All right. Dex. I think I actually forgot to give Vanadia the same intro last year. Sorry, um, sorry, Nick. <laughs> I'm gonna re-roll. Oh wait, I have. I'm gonna re-roll that. But so I have the D six from uh, the Bard, right? The whatever Bardic inspiration. Yep, you are still Bardically inspired. Yes. All right. So. And you're blessed too, right? Yeah. So. 12. Oh my god, what was it? It's, I got 17. <laughs> Did you say it was 18? Uh, it is 20. No, oh, okay. Well, I'm not gonna make that anyway. Okay, no other tricks up your sleeve? No, I already okay. used my luck. And you are engulfed by this thing. Uh, seen as before, you are kind of sort of like stuck to it like flypaper and slowly sinking in, but you're still visible to uh, your companions. Do I have to do a constitution save for the less concentration for this, or is that like a, only an attack? I think only if you take damage. Yeah, I think it's okay. if you take damage. So you don't take any damage. It's, just, it's, it's literally just like getting like snagged and thrown into a pool of water, pretty much. Not to say the danger of suffocation isn't real, but it's almost like the slime got watered down, like it doesn't have any of the caustic properties that a lot of these things are known for. charges and do another fireball on those uh the four slimes over there that she hit last time okay so dc 13 deck save okay. and i also have to roll a d20 and a, on a one the staff i think breaks oh no they just got a uh oh it's not a natural one it's a dirty one All right, well, they still take half. Oh, I said natural one, so they, they failed, though. They would have, or it wasn't a natural one, but they rolled a one after their modifier. They, they rolled a five and have negative four. Um, what are the over jellies? Well, they take 29 damage if they pass, and 14, I'm sorry, 29 damage if they failed, and 14 if they pass. Okay, so they are all going to take 29 damage this time. So these guys uh, are all essentially incinerated. Nice. Uh, there may be one that can use one. your bonus action and transfer Hunter's Mark over to uh, the white, uh, big white blob. Okay. And then action surge and attack it. How many attacks does she get? Twice? Two or three? Uh, three altogether, I believe. I think one of them is a bonus action. One of them, uh, one of them is a bonus action, so if you use Hunter's Mark, it would only be two. Yeah. yeah, so she's going to fire two bolts at this thing. Okay. Uh, so this is going to be plus eight to hit. Uh, 
Okay, so that's 16 to hit with Bless. Okay, yep, that hits. And, uh... That's a 12 to hit on the second one. That also hits. That is the target AC on this thing. Is oh, okay. I'll just, I'm just running all the damage I want here. Make it easy. Uh, plus 8. So 21 damage. Okay. It is just on the edge of bloody at this point. You're thinking this thing's right around the 300 hit point mark when it's full. So you're, you're right in the realm of 130, I think. And I rolled a 3, so the thing didn't break. Okay. Uh, any movement from Vanadium? Uh, yeah. You know, these kind of like already rolled around, but if these things are down, if she's got any movement left, she's going to try to get it far away. She can from the big white thing. Okay. See, she can just make it to the edge of the ring here. That might be generous, but it's okay. Right. Uh, up next is going to be Tohan. Tohan's going to do a thing. Dwarven thrower, great webmaster, recklessly. That's another nat 20. Oh, and uh, when Vanidia hit the thing again, it spit Maggie back out. So. Oh, nice. Seems like any damage that you cause to the thing makes it spit out whatever's on its surface. Jesus. Damage will suck. Uh, 30 damage on the first one. Okay. It's now it's now bloodied. Uh, 27 to hit on the second, which obviously hits a lot. Seventeen. 26 damage on the second. Okay. So 56 total that round for a turn. So as this thing passes its uh, bloody threshold, now it begins to writhe and shake, and uh, it looks like it begins to split down the middle. Does it spit Maggie out? Yeah, it spit, it spit Maggie out after Vanadia hit it. Um, and once it passes its bloody mark, it splits into two. Oh boy. Albeit smaller, I got the one on the left. Albeit smaller slimes, but there are now two. Uh, the Eye of Vagos is now telling you that each of these has about 75 hit points, so it seems like it split its hit point pool as well when it uh, split down. Like these guys would both be reading 75 out of 150. So that was your first two hits. You did not kill anything, right? So no more hits from you. Nope, that's it. Any movement or anything? No. Okay. I mean, I guess I'll put myself between me and Maggie. Or Maggie and the thing, so. Okay. Oh, it's all over. It's not all over. To stand up, yeah. <laughs> Weird. Got it. Okay, there we go. Perfect. We're gonna love this. Um, see, the black puddings are resting and moving forward before I turn. One of them is within range to try to strike Adrian. So, black food. Seventeen to hit, which does not hit Adrian. He to get an eighteen armor class. It just smacks off his armor, and he's like, "Ha! Foolish blob!" Uh, Ariel, it's going to be your turn. Oh, you're muted, Jen. Sorry. How far apart are the slimes? Uh, like... one of them's got about a. Five to ten foot lead on these other two over here. 
These guys are all. I mean, bad. are they within a, like a twenty foot? They're within twenty feet of each other, right? Oh uh, yeah, if you centered her like right here, yeah. you could probably center her right. over here without getting angry. You're gonna get Maggie's right. frying pan, but I think it's used to it. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to cast uh, level four erupting earth on them. Okay. And it's a dexterity saving throw of 17. Dexterity. Oh, that is a natural one. They got a negative two on that check. Big fan. Alright. So that will be uh nineteen damage. Okay. Uh these guys are on each now, of them. They are now all not quite bloody. Just just below the bloody. Uh anything else? Uh no, I'll call that my turn. Uh, wait, actually, where where am I? Uh, how far away from am I? Uh, am I from them? Uh, from the slimes themselves. I mean, you're twenty feet up and like twenty feet back. All right, I'm gonna move back another thirty feet. So you like fly over here by the throne. All right, that'll be my turn. Adrian gets his turn after you. Let's see the damage just so I can see. Yeah, plus three to try to strike this slime. He is oblivious to everything else going on around him. He's just focused on the uh, small picture right now. Six hit. For ten damage. The slime will say is now bloodied. The other two are still not quite bloodied. He gets multi attack. He rolled a natural one. Ooh, Adrian. So, uh, yeah, he swings. The first one kind of slices into this thing. The second one just, he just whiffs it. Like, it's almost, it's probably comical to watch. Meanwhile, he's talking shit to the thing. He's like, like, it, like it can respond. It's a completely non-sentient creature. It just functions on instinct, but he's talking to it like it's a, it's his like mortal enemy. Back, foul beast! Lest you know the wrath of my steel. Fantasy schlock at its best. All right, Maggie, your turn. <laughs> All right, uh, is the perimeter of, I mean, like, where the last slime was killed close enough that you can move the pan to the white jelly guy? Uh, what's the pan's range? Oh, sorry, 20 feet? Uh, not to the white guy, but she can okay. move towards him. Uh, she, the pan is kind well, of hanging out by these two black puddings right now. Okay. Uh, yeah, what is it in towards the center again? How much? Uh, let's see. So from... To the pan is 12 times 5, so 60. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so, whatever black pudding is nearby, nice, got a net 20. And so that's going to be 21 damage to whatever black pudding it's near. Okay. Uh, you can kill the one by Adrian, or you can do damage to one of the other ones. Uh, might as well kill one. Adrian looks at the pan and says, That one was mine! Uh, the pan does not respond. <laughs> Alright. Um, <laughs> just gonna throw a... Uh, let's see. Another guiding bolt at one of the jellies. Or one of the big guys in the middle. Good. Um... Oh my god. <laughs> Another nat 20. Nice. Awesome. Maggie is sick of all these wow. motherfucking slimes in this motherfucking cave. Exactly. 
Um, do you see damage on that? Oh, there it is, 64. Holy shit. Okay, this thing is almost dead now. Well, plus it's doubled, right? Because it's radiant. Oh, that's 64 before it doubled it? I thought it would yep. double. Wow. Okay, yeah. So, so Maggie's Guiding Bolt literally just absolutely annihilates this thing. Yeah, because it would double the thing. Yeah, that's right. It would double... I guess it wouldn't... It probably wouldn't double the modif the, the modifier on your original roll for being radiant, but it would double the base damage. So regardless, this thing's dead. I don't want to do the math. Um... Mag Maggie says to the group, and you have advantage on the next attack against this guy. Just kidding, obviously. <laughs> uh, anything else for Maggie? Um, no, if if the uh, if any of the slimes are like close enough that it's a danger, she'll move away. But otherwise, she'll like kind of stay where she is. You're about twenty feet from this other half of this white pudding here. Um, yeah, she'll back up a little. Would you say Zach? I'm sorry. Uh, it's going to be Vanadia's initiative. Okay, yeah, she's going to uh, shoot twice with a crossbow. Okay. So it's an 18 and a 21 before bless. So that's just going to do. Twenty four damage. Twenty three damage, I lied. Okay. Uh as you do so. It's not white. Uh, and Tohan's gonna attack with a Dwarven Thrower, Korea Webmaster, recklessly. Twenty-five to hit on this first one. Twenty-five to hit on the second. Uh, 28 and 27 damage, so, um, 55. Okay, uh, so it goes well past its bloody mark on the second attack. Uh, is that 55 total for both, or 55 for the second one? What's that? Was it 55 damage for both total? Both total. Okay, so yeah, this thing... It was 28 and 27. Yep, so as it goes down, you can't, like, the Eye of Agos would see this anyways, Maggie. Um, you see it go down from 75 hit points down to, like, 20. And as it does so, it splits, and each of these become this tiny little 10 hit point blob. Um, which, if you guys want, we can be out of initiative if you can step on. You can step on them. That's fine. I'm sure you'll be able to kill two 10 hit point things at this point. That's my to hit on any of you guys yet. Um. Yeah, so you guys are left kind of uh, cleaning this area up more so than anything. Uh, although you do notice that there seems to be 
an influx of kind of ooze and slime and things that seems to be running down the walls now. And it is, uh, it is rapidly beginning to kind of coalesce and form into more and more of this just nasty snot kind of texture that's filling the room. Um, it seems perhaps that the Pudding King's physical presence may have been eliminated here for the time being, but it seems something is still drawing these slimes to the area. Um, and you can hear a voice echo throughout the room. My master will return to this plane. Jubilex shall not be defeated. But it's like, defeated. It's like fading in the background. Like, like you're pretty sure that he's as defeated as he's going to get tonight. Would you guys like to uh, do anything else in the room here? I mean, you've got a uh, steady flow of slime coming in. Um, Maggie, Maggie puts up her like shield symbol and says, Jubilex, be gone from this place in hopes that that does anything. Okay, uh, roll me a religion check. Religion, where are you? There you are. Seven. All right. Uh, it doesn't seem like Hestia is particularly attentive right now. There is no sign that it does anything of uh, physical nature, anyways. Great. Adrian uh, kind of looks at the growing wall of slime pouring down, and now it's starting to hit the floor, and it's just seeping into the room from every crack and crevice. There's just these nasty puddles of things kind of coming in. And they're slowly beginning to blob up and reform what look like these these ooze creatures along the outside walls. But now there's not just like eight or nine of them. Now there's like 20, 30, 40, uh, indicating to you that it may be a good time to try to make your hasty retreat from this area, uh, unless you had another plan. Erin, is okay with getting out of here, but she's ready. She'll back up anything anybody else wants to do. Can we? Can we like tell why? Like, where are they coming from? It's basically like all the cave slime is coalescing, or is are they? Yeah, is it, like... it seems like all these slimes are kind of just coming in from you know, as the expression goes, coming in from the woodwork, or in this case, the stonework, I guess. But anywhere that there's a small crack in the wall or like a small like air shaft that may be out to for fresh air or something like there just seems to be they're they're literally able to squeeze in through spaces as small as an inch. Yeah, by now, like, the back, like, ten feet of the room is pretty much just covered in these things crawling all over each other. The one the one thing that you guys have going for you is that it seems like they're not particularly focused on you. They're just filling the room. Uh, yeah, Maggie suggests that they get back and tell the town that they might need to barricade, but in the meantime, she's going to try to remove the remove curse from the cave and see if that helps. So, yeah, at your touch, all curses affecting an object end. If the object is a cursed magic item, its curse remains, but the spell breaks its owner's attunement to the object so it can be removed or discarded. All right, so you're trying to do remove curse to everything in the cave, right? Like on the cave itself, on the stone. What about this fancy staff? Yeah, sure. Um, uh... Aerith, quickly, uh, you cast Identify on the staff. Okay. Um, 
as you cast Identify on this, as this knowledge begins to fill your head, um, you actually take 15 points of psychic damage as you are accosted with pictures uh, from... It's almost dreamlike in quality, like it's just these brief little flashes of this staff in various incarnations doing massive amounts of damage, uh, you know, in battles and through, like, uh, backstabbing and just, just in general, it's had a really, you, you get like a flash of the history of this staff, and, uh, as soon as your identify spell clicks, uh, Reggie says, oh, hang on, I'll transfer that so the group can see it. And flat, the Eye of Agos, you know, he's projecting what the Eye of Agos would see, essentially, begins in big, bold letters, in, like, bright purple that you've never seen before for any of these objects, starts flashing, Wanda Vorkis. Dun, dun, dun. Ah! Uh -huh. So I think of this big bone thing is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, so Aaron is. We will say, for the sake of storytelling, that Aaron, Aaron, if you were identifying it as Maggie was casting Remove Curse on the cave, and you identify it at the same time that Maggie completes her spell, and so you literally make that aha. As Maggie finishes her last word, and there is a absolute explosion that comes from this staff. Um, everyone roll me a dexterity saving throw. Uh, we're going to say, because you guys are in such close proximity, this is going to be a DC 20. I think we all, in, unless it's been more than 10 rounds, we all still have blessed. Too, yeah, I believe so. you guys do still have blessed. I don't think it was more than 10 rounds, so. Oh my god. <laughs> I got 20 exactly. So I get advantage on dexterity saving throws, and I got a 1 on my plus. Excellent. I got not 1. Uh, everything adds up to 4. <laughs> so. I got 17. Okay. Uh, let's see. Ultimate some ridiculous dexterity bonus. Plus whatever her dexterity bonus is. I want to click on that when we encounter it. Okay. Okay. Tohan, when this explosion goes off with this staff in your hand, I feel like it does only 10 damage to you, uh, force damage. Everyone else, would, if you failed it, it would be 20. Uh, Adrian, I'm assuming, is probably going to fail it as well. Yep. Um, so everyone takes 20 force damage, with the exception of Tohan, who only takes 10. I feel like that leaves you standing there in like that cartoon thing where something explodes in your hand and it's just like black and like your hair is all blown back. Well, I'm, you don't have hair, I guess, as a dragonborn. I'm not that's how that works. Good thing I got that metal hand. Yeah. <laughs> Erin kind of shakes herself and then floats to Tohan and asks if she could see the staff. Uh, yeah. But, I was but like, before she takes... No, before she... Easily. Yeah, before she takes it, though, she asks Re Reggie the best way for her to handle it. Um, so Reggie tells you he's fairly certain that Maggie's remove curse work, and that that was some sort of a spell glyph that was designed to attempt to kill whoever was removing said curse, but since you guys are not dead, it clearly did not do its job properly. Um, he does warn you that throughout history, the Wanda Orcus has been known to be sort of 
used uh, in a way to be subversive. Um, often, Orcus himself would let the wand sort of fall into the wrong hands, or in his case, you know, for, for his viewpoint, it would be the right hands to cause all sorts of chaos amongst the mortal realms. Uh, so he cautions you, he's, he advises you probably not to directly touch it. He says it does seem that uh, Mr. Asir's dragon arm, his metal arm that he's been using, has been acting as some sort of an insulator. Otherwise, it's very possible that when Toan picked it up, he would have been killed. I asked Reddy, Reggie, what sort of material can I use to safely really, uh, handle it? Uh, he tells you that he's not certain again, but he thinks that the curse is now removed, so it should be okay to touch it now. Um, as far as getting it to its uh, proper form, the Rod of Attrition, which is what you're attempting to do, or I'm, I'm assuming attempting to uh, figure yeah. out here. Um, this is that some sort of a spell uh, to actually change its physical shape to match, to match that of the Rod of Attrition, uh, which he can describe to you well enough to kind of get you to understand what it would look like, and uh, tells you he can kind of guide the spell. Um, but it would be something right, so like, something, along something the lines that's gonna... of a polymorph or a trans like transfiguration spell of some sort. Okay, I have polymorph. Okay, yeah, he suggests trying polymorph on it, seeing if that will work. Right. It, does he think this is something I can do right now, or is it going to take a long period of like study and time? No, I mean, if you have the spell available to you, then he sees no reason you couldn't try it. He does caution right. you that there may be adverse effects, but you're, he's not sure. Like, he doesn't have a 100% guarantee that it won't activate some form of wild magic since you guys are still in the Underdark. It is a very powerful item. Did the uh, remove curse stop the slimes from flowing in, or are they still doing that? No, they're still flowing in. They don't seem to be any sort of a curse. There seems to be something else going on. So now you suggest that they get get out, uh, warn the townsfolk, and then um, try the spell elsewhere. All right. So Zach, can I can I tech? So can I at this point grab the? Uh, you know, I'm gonna just to be safe. I'm gonna grab some fabric in my hands and not touch the staff directly. Okay. And I'm going to grab it from Tohan. Yeah. I mean, you can think of the warning that Reggie would give you as something similar to, like, what Gandalf told Frodo about the ring. Like, you know, it's... Just be, be fucking careful with it. It's kind of the vibe that he's giving you on it. Like, it still could be Oh, yeah, dangerous. well... Aerith, until she has a chance to work with it and do the polymorph, is not taking any chances. So she she takes the staff and uh, wraps wraps it in some fabric and carefully puts it into her backpack. So um yeah, you guys are easily able to outpace these slimes walking over to the other door. There's no need for any other combat in the room. Uh, if you, all you want to do is leave, um, you can kind of knock on the door with like some prearranged signal you gave the person who's standing on the other side from the gnomes, and they would let you back out. Um, and as you would return, the digger matooks, the two, uh, the male and female that are running the um, settlement here, are overjoyed at your return. And they, they quickly ask, like, what, well, what, what happened? Oh, it was a big one. You, 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 uh, you had a real problem there. So have you, have you stopped the source of the slime infestation? Oh yeah, that's done. Excellent. Um, I, excellent. He says the pudding king had been turned into a, the voice of the demon Orcus. I wouldn't suggest anybody going into the slime pit anytime soon. Um, so, assuming you relate the events kind of as they occurred. Uh, the digger Matooks would assure you that they would set up their, uh, they would set up a squad of what they call burners, uh, 
people equipped with uh, basically flamethrowers to go in. Like, they're these artificer tools that would be built on site, I'm, I'm assuming, by these gnomes, because gnomes like artificing. Um, so the Digimatics assure you that they will be able to, most likely, with the uh, death of this Pudding King, uh, go in and burn out any remaining slimes. They're not, they don't seem overly concerned about it. Uh, you know, that might be, that, that might not be the smartest thing on their part, but who are you to argue with the village leader, right? Um, now they do offer you transport to the city of Gondalgrim and tell you that Gondalgrim, uh, has a main gate that leads to the surface world. Uh, and they are have traditionally been friendly towards outside folk. Uh, the Deep Domes have a trade route that goes that way, and they will pretty easily be able to cart you there within a day or two. If you so um, choose. Maggie asks if the if there's anything that they can think of as far as like a source of the ghosts or anywhere where they're particularly bad or uh, you know, you kind of got, you know, you, Tells them she would like to help them find peace. You're um, breaking up, Maggie. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, she tells tells them that she'd like to help the ghost find peace, and is asked asks if there's like a. Ground. Uh, mostly they are in the lower kind of uh, ward where a lot of the residences are. Uh, most of the ghosts are fairly harmless. Uh, they just kind of spook people every once in a while. There was the one poltergeist, but uh, the Madam Diggerma took assures you that she seems to have that well in hand at this point. She says, okay. I, be I believe that the ghosts of our ancestors are something that we will most likely have to live with for a very long time. Uh, it just gives us motivation to defend our city properly from threats such as these this sl slime invasion and these were-rats that... I'm glad that you've made peace with them, but I don't know that I trust them yet. Um, yeah, and I also, before they leave, wants to go and... The the Were-Rat King had asked about, like, basically make designating a cleric of Hestia, and so she wants to go and try to make that a reality. Okay, yeah. Um, so I would say Maggie is able to pretty quickly teach uh, one of the... Uh, one of the were-rats uh, that has an interest in religion, uh, the basic principles of Hestia, and uh, I mean, I don't know, I'm assuming that would go something along the lines of uh, teaching them the ways of cooking and things like, you know, it's like a little montage of you, like, showing them how to make a dish and explaining it, like, relating it to religion, because it feels like all Hestia's stuff is, food kind of is almost like a religion in and of itself. Yeah. And she'll probably, she'd like invite uh, the Digger Matooks to designate somebody from their community too and try to make that like a group initiation for one from each community. Excellent. Here's a, here's a throwback. I would award Maggie one good point for that. Nice. Trying to make friends. Good job. Um, I'm hanging those good over my bed. Absolutely. And, you know, with some common ground there, maybe these two clans can come together and uh, defend Lingdenstone from any future threats. Um, so you guys are able to rest up again. Not that any of you really took damage, I don't think. Um, but you are fully rested before you depart. They, as the Digger Batooks insist, on providing a large feast uh, where you are held to be the heroes of the town. So Maggie's also going to bring, uh, I think, the druid back to life, or try to at least. And okay. find um, going that's about it. It's about a day's travel back through the Underdark to get back there. I mean, I would let you kind oh. of, like, uh, you know. Well, they've taken relics from both of them, so they, from the two friends. Oh, so... that's true. Yeah, that's right. You guys did take body parts, didn't you? Yeah, so they only need a body, a body part. And I think she can only... It's not called relics, they're body parts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Adrian is down with it. Okay. Um, 
So assuming, I'm, I'm, I am assuming that you guys have diamonds for this, for the resurrection spells. Yeah, Maggie actually gathered a bunch of diamonds for this kind of spell. So I, I'll have to look up how many, but they definitely have enough. She definitely has enough to raise the druid. Okay. Um, yeah, I give Maggie back her dwarf and throw her thing too. Right. So... Thanks for letting me use it. You got it. Thanks for working those slimes. Tawan's like, it's pretty neat. It's no axe, but it's pretty neat. <laughs> Um, uh, Aaron has asked. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, Aaron has asked uh, Tohan if she could grab a couple of gems that carry uh, level seven and level six spells. Yeah, uh, I didn't take any of those gems. I thought you took them all. Oh, I I didn't realize. Oh, okay, I have them. Yeah, I thought so. Then we get um, then we get like what, like two level nine gems. Yeah, it was like two level nine, three level eight, four level seven, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down. Oh, okay, cool. And you all guys right, have so... a bunch of those spell jumps. Yeah, yeah. You, you, all right. You gotta, you gotta like. You gotta... I know we're gonna sell some of them, but if you don't mind, I'm gonna use a few of them to hold some spells. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love one that had a haste in it. Oh, I don't. I'm sorry, I don't have haste. Oh, wait, he's using that. Right? Or does Maggie have these? Not prepared. I'll, uh, I think it's possible, so I'll have to, I'd have to do that after a long rest. Um. So, yeah, she can stock stock up during their trip. Um, but, so, yeah. Right. Any other preparations okay. you guys would like to make in town? Well, I'm curious to know what happens when the druid is raised, because... Um, we're trying to figure out the mystery of like why why time is so weird down here. All right. So when the druid is brought back to life, uh, it's first off, it's a very slow process for the actual resurrection. Like it takes almost a full hour of like it starts out with just that one piece, and from that piece grows out like the skeleton, and then you can see like the both the muscle and tissue forming underneath it, and finally the skin is growing back. Um, oddly enough, according to Adrian, however, as he takes his first breath back, he is still an old man. And Adrian swears that when he was with him, he was not more than five years older than Adrian. So he's somewhere in his maybe 30s. Looks like he's 30s as a human. Um... But as he comes back, he looks like he's like a 75-year-old man. He's like like all wasted away, long white beard, uh, and he sits up. <laughs> oh, where am I? Adrian says, come, come, you're with friends. Ah, who are you? It's me, Adrian. Say, Adrian, after all these years, I found you! Ah! Adrian kind of looks up at all you guys like, you guys, it's, it's him. I swear he wasn't this old before. I asked, I asked him, uh, what happened? I asked the druid what happened to him when he got separated from his group. It's the strangest thing we were. I remember we were all caravanning. We were, we were headed to a city in the west, underground, uh, somewhere deep beneath Waterdeep, a trading post. It was, it was on the third day. The drow, yes, the drow attacked us. We fought most of them off, took, lost some men. Adrian kind of nods. He's like, I remember that. But things from there get a bit fuzzy. I I believe we got separated. Several of us did. And we made our way through the tunnel trying to find the others. Seems like we had wandered for weeks. Then one day, Francio was gone. He just disappeared up and out of nowhere. We woke up and he was not there. Two days later, Edgar. He was gone. 
couldn't have been more than another week, and at last, Thorm, the last one with me, he was gone as well. It feels like I've wandered down there for years. And he's, as he's doing, saying this, he's like rubbing his face, and then his hand comes across his beard, and he's like, ah, ah, what's this? I'm old! Ah. Maggie, do you have a spell, maybe, that could help him? I can't hear you, Dave. Can someone give me a quick summary of what happened between the time he woke up and the like day three thing? They all kind of got separated, and he, one by one, they kind of disappeared, and he doesn't really remember much, and then after you resurrected him, he came back old. I was thinking, like, maybe, like, a greater restoration or something might help him. Uh, let me look up the spell real quick. I, I don't think... want to be old! <laughs> um, well, she suggests that he comes with and says that uh, her lady's powers bring him back, but the process may be slow and that it might be a few days before he's fully restored. In the meantime, she can try a greater uh, restoration. So... We can assume that we're doing all this before our long rest, right? Yeah. Yeah, Maggie's definitely got a few things she wants to do before long rest. I feel like I should have prepped a tavern map for this conversation. Um, do I have greater restoration prepared? Yep. Okay. So, uh, yeah, she'll cast greater restoration. Um, so, as you cast a greater restoration over this man, um, it seems to dull the effects of this age that he's got, where it doesn't necessarily make him younger, but it makes him look like a healthier old person. Does that make sense? Like, he fills out a little bit more, like, his some of his muscle tissue kind of redevelops a little bit, where it was almost, like, sunken down to the bone. Um, his... Gray, his stark white beard turns like a slightly darker shade of gray. Uh, there's uh, the listlessness in his eyes sort of goes back to uh, a reasonable amount of shimmer and like shine to his eyes where he doesn't look so so like dusty eyed. And uh, he, he sits up a little bit better. He's like, oh, oh, that feels a little better. Thank you very much. I am not used to this. I. Oh. Do not feel well. Uh, please, I am forever in your debt for saving me. Adrian, what what are your friends named? He says, Oh well this this is Murder Lizard. This, Hello. This is this is the stabby one, and he points at Vanadia. He says, This is Mom, and he points at Maggie. And he says, and that's Harriet. She set stuff on fire. She got this cool earth hand thing that she does, and he's like, Earth Earth hand? Uh. He's like, Yeah, they're they're pretty great. They uh they found me. You see, I uh for lack of memory, I'm going to say this druid's name is Bordrick. Yeah, that sounds right. Sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, viewers, leave in the comment below, you know. What his name is from the other episode because I don't remember. <laughs> Bord Bordrick. It it was only a few days since I had last seen you. I swear. I. There is some strange mystery afoot here. There's no way that we were separated for weeks on end. There's no way you could have come back as. Well, as old as all this. Ah, oh, I don't want to be old. Perhaps you should come with us in the morning. We're 
who will be setting out for Gondolgrim. Perhaps there is a, another wizard there that can figure this out, or a cleric. All right. I guess I'll go with you. Was oh. there someone else we were going to resurrect as well, or? Yeah, she can only do one per day. Um, oh, gotcha. But we found another of his friends and have another relic. Um, so yeah, uh, Maggie suggests that he come along. And, um, she also wants to cast sending and like check in with Lulu and see what's going on up on the surface, and let her know that they're a day away. <laughs> Um, so the message would come back from Lulu, uh, assuming that she's paraphrasing what you're saying to her, uh, for a second here, um, she would tell you Zariel is reforming her Hellriders, this time with the help of this lovely fellow she met named Ashnak. Uh, he seems to really know what he's doing. <laughs> Is that our work friend? Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so it seems Zariel at some point has hooked up with, whether it's the same Ashnak as what you met before, or just another parallel universe version of Ashnak, we don't know, because I don't think you guys know whether or not you're back in your world, or some reasonable facsimile thereof. We don't know. There could still be lizard people, you know? Other than Toha. Um, she tells you that Tiamat is gathering her forces in the north and that uh, Baldur's Gate has fallen. Which Venedia, of course, is going to be very dismayed. And when she says fallen... She literally means fallen. That's what she says. That's pretty much where the message cuts off. She just says, when I mean when I say fallen, I mean literally fallen. So the gate fell down? Yeah, there's no there's no other there's it's just silence after that. <laughs> um well all right, any other town events here going on for the night? Or are you guys uh, do your long rest and uh Aaron has asked Maggie if she wants some of these uh spell gems. Yeah, I started adding them to my inventory just to keep track that we have them. Cool. Yeah, but all is there. <laughs> or what are or most importantly, what are the higher level ones? We have one so nine. What, what level eight. do you want? Uh, I'll I'll have to think about it. I didn't consider like what to use those for. Um, I can uh, let me make sure I have haste, but I can prepare that overnight and so store one tomorrow. What level are you up to, Maggie? Spellwise. Uh, seven. Yeah, me, me too. I, I, so we have three level sevens. Do you want to each take one and save one to sell? Yeah, what did we decide? Like, is it something that, like, we could store Firestorm in it and give it to Tohan and Tohan can cast Firestorm, or is it like... I can only cast it. I can only use it if I... Uh, can cast that level spell. So I can't cast anything beyond a third level spell. Gotcha. All right. So, Or actually a fifth level, because I can cast fifth level commune with nature, I guess. I don't even know if that's how those things are supposed to work. If you can't cast it, though, you got to do a TC 10 plus the spell level for Arcana, I think, to be able to use it. Like, like if, you try to ca if you try to use one beyond... Your spellcasting modifier. Got it. Okay. Yeah, she'll do some useful stuff with the lower level ones tomorrow, and uh, 
Probably yeah, not. We have a... four level six, so we'll split the uh, two each. Yeah, she could um, cast some like healing words into there for level five. I mean, I guess the ma the main benefit of them is that they like unused spell slots get stored in them, right? So she could use yeah, that. Basically, you, you you store a spell in there now, so you don't have to use a spell slot later. Yeah. Um, Not to mention, it might just increase the value of the spell gem if there's a spell stored inside of it, if you guys are yeah. going to sell them. That's true. All right, well, she'll take at least one fifth level for now and store a healing word in there. Well, for now, if, uh, we can do it over the uh, chat later, but uh, we'll just split them up in half, and any, any ones that don't split evenly, we'll just set those aside as ones to yeah. set up to sell for now. Sounds good. Yeah, if somebody could put the inventory of what we have in the chat, that'd be really helpful. I think it might already be there. Probably. Yeah, you probably just gonna scroll up. Awesome. It's a um, better game log than our game log. Yeah. <laughs> um, Maggie suggests to the group. She tells them, um, "I'm, I'm, I've been uh, communing with Hestia to the point that I can ask her for direct intervention." Um, maybe I should ask her to intervene with Tiamat. Does that sound good? Erin doesn't see any reason not to, though she asks, she asks uh, Reggie's opinion. I mean, if she's got nothing better to do. <laughs> yeah. Does Reggie yeah. have anything to say about it? Uh, Reggie would politely decline to know the will of the gods. Fair enough. Word. I mean, uh, it's, it's a long shot for that to happen, though, isn't it? Right. So, yeah, Maggie, before tucking in for the night, I mean, she'll definitely, like, celebrate with the town and, you know, cook and consecrate temples to Hestia and all that. Um, but then before tucking in for the night, she'll, um, yeah, huddle around one of those fires with whoever wants to be with her and um, ask Hestia to intervene in um, Tiamat's destruction of the world. And uh, Aaron is willing to meditate with her on that if she wants some uh, company. Cool. Yeah. Maybe her little acolytes, new acolytes on everyone. Yeah, I, I'm okay. I'm just, I'm just, I guess I'm just, I, I don't ever, I always forget about it, but I am like the, uh, I, aren't I, uh, yeah, like the, the, uh, the something avatar, of the goddess of magic or something, the something like that? The avatar of Mistara. Yeah. yeah, avatar of Mistara. So, may, I don't know. Maybe we can commune together and, uh, focus. Sweet. Yeah, Maggie gladly takes all the support and rolls a 32, which is way higher than the 13 or lower. So I'm assuming that means no response from Hestia. So my assumption is, is that a response of this nature might not be answered the way it's the, like it's not going to be like a telegraph it's not going to be like yeah okay sure no problem but i would say that that night when maggie goes to sleep she probably has some very strange dreams uh in which she would see some, i would say that she would see a dark shadowy figure approaching uh, a council of well-known gods. Uh, like, these are like, you know, gods that you know exist in the realms. Um, and there's no sound in this dream, but the shadowy figure, you can just see its mouth, and it speaks a single word. And when it does, uh, one of these gods just instantly is smited, just drops dead. And when you awake the next morning with kind of a start, a little bit earlier even for you than you normally would, 
uh, echoing in your ears is a just kind of uh, surreal voice that says, find the lost words, and then just kind of slowly fades away into the dreamscape as you wake up. Um, Arianth, when you fall asleep that night, you also have a dream. Your dream, you see a giant raven and a giant spider in locked in just mortal combat. They are tearing at each other. Lightning is crashing across the sky and like meteorites are like coming down on this crazy landscape. Um, it's all jagged rocks. It's dark. It's foreboding. And as you stand on the edge of this cliff watching this battle occur in this dream, uh, you suddenly feel a thin hand creep across your shoulder, but when you turn to look to see who it is, you wake up with a cold sweat, kind of startled. Um, Tohan, you, uh, you have a dream as well. Your dream is glorious. You are up to your waist in bodies and just a pool of blood. You are engaged in just full-blown combat. Just, there is a sea of people coming at you, uh, and you are just murdering all of them. I mean, straight, like, you're calling shots and stuff. You're like, beheading it! Like, chopping it <laughs> off. You're having a grand time. And, Sounds uh, awesome. I mean, it's like, I feel like this is one of those things that, yes, it's a comic foil, but it's also very important. Like, it's like, I'm walking on sunshine, whoa, is playing. And you're just, you're fucking going to town killing shit, just nonstop. You wake up with, like, a nice big stretch, like, oh, yeah, that was relaxing. <laughs> Can't remember if that was real or dream. Yeah. Oh, man, why aren't all my dreams so cool? <laughs> it's just like my greatest hits. Yeah. <laughs> just, just say, like taking down the kaiju with like that big football stone and. Just... Yeah, you're thinking about the dream when you woke up. There's like the little thought bubble, and it's you killing somebody, and you you shoot finger guns at yourself, and then your dream self shoots finger guns back at you. <laughs> um, and Vanadia, we will uh. Oh, I suppose, I don't know if I should tell you guys what's going on with Vanadia or if I should just tell Nick next time. I mean, I suppose I'll tell you guys too so you can remind me to tell Nick next time. <laughs> it's probably a safe bet. Um, Vanadia, when she comes down and joins you all at the breakfast table, relates her dream to you. That'll be a safe way to do it. Um, where she sees Baldur's Gate uh, sinking below the earth, uh, much as El Terrell did in the days before you wound up in Avernus. Uh, and it seems like perhaps whatever came up from Avernus is now still trying to pull these cities down into El. Uh, and of course, Renadia is very concerned because she doesn't know that combined with what Lulu said about Baldur's Gate has fallen. She really wants to, I'm assuming, go back to Baldur's Gate at some point. Um, that would probably be a pressing issue for her. Uh, and so you guys are able to travel to Gauntelgrim at this point with uh, no real incidents along the way. The Gnomish tunnels are fairly secure as long as you keep your head down. Watch out for uh, the cross beams. Hey, Zach? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, can I say during the, my uh, four hours of free time during the night where I was awake that I uh, worked with uh, Reggie to uh, polymorph that uh, staff? Yes, uh, absolutely. So, like, you know, we'd say you probably went to bed at the same time as everybody else, but woke up, like,
like after about four hours, and you're like, all right, I'm good. Um, so you take the yeah, wand. Assume, assume I might use a spell gem for that. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, you uh, you burn the contents of the spell gem. The spell gem itself is still fine. Um, I don't believe they, they don't like explode or go bad or anything. They're just, now it's just empty again. Um, and with Reggie's guidance, make me an arcana check, so with advantage. I get advantage, yeah. Nineteen. All right. So, uh, Reggie kind of gives you a mental image of what this thing is supposed to look like. And, uh, as you are shaping it, uh, you notice that the, at first there is some resistance to this thing. Um, you've never encountered this in a spell before, but... It's almost as if the wand is fighting back against being polymorphed. Uh, but you are, in fact, eventually able to do so and get it to look the way you want it to look. And Reggie seems content with it. He says it looks very much a, you know, perfect facsimile of the Rod of Attrition. He says, now, I believe all that's left is to just connect this to the other six parts. But you care to do the honor, Miss Arians. I haven't officially done it, though, right? No, you haven't, like, put the, the staff together yet. Like, yeah, you, okay, you so changed is, it to look... Just... You changed it to look like it. It doesn't seem to be cursed anymore. But you have not attached so it I'm... to the other six yet. Alright, and... But I mean, this doesn't. This isn't technically putting them in the right order, though. This is just adding it like I have with the rest of the pieces, right? Yeah. Uh, Reggie says that it is true that he does not know the exact order in which the staffs, uh, component or the rods components need to be connected. Uh, but he is fairly certain that given enough time, he can brute force it. Aerith isn't. Aerith's not sure if she should uh, connect the last piece yet or not. She thinks she wants. She tells Reggie that she wants to uh, keep that piece separate for now until she can meditate it on on it more and make sure that she's not going to cause some kind of cataclysmic reaction before she has all the information she needs. Reggie, uh, Reggie seems disappointed. So very, very well, Miss. I, I understand. She, she, she tells Reggie, just give her a little, just a little bit more time. Yes, I mean, I've waited a few hundred years. What's, what's a few more hours, right? <laughs> and, and if Erinus has any more time, she actually takes a moment to kind of commune and uh, try to communicate with her, with the uh, with the god, the goddess that she's uh, an avatar to, and see if she can glean any more information. Um, I feel like Aranith has been so invested in studying and kind of learning her whole life that the religion part of things is probably less developed. So it's almost an awkward scene when she tries to pray. Yeah, she, like, she like, does she, feel like, very awkward like, about very, it. Like, how do I do this? I don't, I'm not sure. Like, it's, it's, you know, this is a really cool character building scene in a way. Um, yeah, like, I would say, make me a religion check to see how, how well that your prayer goes. Not 20, so 23. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, so, yeah, you're like, you know, like, I don't know, what's, what, like, if you were praying to this god to try to get some sort of guidance, like, what would your prayer be? 
All right. So Erin is, is, I mean, she's she's definitely feeling awkward because she she's not very religious, but she's like, oh, great goddess that I have been uh, destined to work to represent. I now have all the parts to the staff that have that have been such a big part of my destiny and uh, the. Uh, I can't think of the proper word. Prophecy. Yeah, prophecy. Thank you. The prophecy that surrounds me. Please give me guidance in what I should do next as far as putting the, this last piece together with the ones I already have. You sit for a moment thinking on this and thinking like, hmm, well, maybe that didn't work. And then suddenly you feel almost energized, like, like it's kind of the feeling you get from that first cup of coffee during the day. And you think to yourself, like, well, that's different. And uh, suddenly... Your entire body is enveloped in a kind of light purple aura. And this is, it begins to kind of glow and little tendrils shoot off from it and begin dancing around the room. And like almost this miniature swirling galaxy of lights is now just spinning around you in your room. And I love that because it's like three in the morning. So like all of a sudden, whatever this little fucking underground inn that never sees daylight it's just got the craziest fucking Floyd laser light show going on in one of the rooms. <laughs> um, and you hear a soft voice in your mind and it says it has already been foretold. We'll make the correct choice when the time comes. I have seen it. And then, kind of slowly, the lights begin to fade. And the aura fades. And then all you're left with is, like, that feeling that you get when you come inside from, like, a really, really cold day. And, like, your hands are all frozen. And you come in and you warm up and you get, like, pins and needles in your hand. Your whole body kind of has that pins and needles thing going on now. But it's like a positive energy. It's not like, you know, not non-detrimental. Alrighty. Alright. Um, right. So yeah, you guys are able to set off and just after a brief day's travel, drive in Gauntle Grim, or at least at the gates of Gauntle Grim. Um, you stand kind of inside of this large rock cavern uh, with... Oops, I'm just trying to see if my camera out here. It's a little slow. Large map. Um, you can see something is amiss because the gates to Gauntle Grim, as the Deep Gnomes would tell you, are never left open. And when you arrive, one of the gates hangs kind of half open on its hinges. Um, it looks like a hurried defense has been kind of made behind the door, as though something forced its way in. Uh, however, the fabled bridge of Gontelgrim, a large stone bridge that uh, stretches across the chasm and is known to activate uh, with a certain power of the doors, uh, sits not connected, so you're not quite sure what happened here. As you, uh, as you begin to approach the gate cautiously, your, uh, your gnome guides bid you an ado, and they take back off on their mind carts. Uh, Bordrick and Adrian are quite dumbfounded as they never saw Gauntelgrim, and so this is, uh, quite the uh, they 
soft voice calls out from behind the door. Well, we've been expecting you. Please, do come in. We should probably cut it there, right? Sure. You can cut I got it there, or you get, or you guys can get the reveal of who it is. All right. Yeah. Let's get that. <laughs> right. Um. I thought, I thought you were doing a cliffhanger. Oh well, it will be, but now it's going to be a better cliffhanger. So as right. you step through the doors of Gontelgrim, uh, into the front gates, uh, you are greeted by. A rather lovely middle-aged woman who, uh, she has long red curly hair and a long purple flowing robe with black kind of, uh, embroidery around the outside edges that, uh, Maggie, you, you look at it and you actually notice that the embroidery is all skulls. And, uh, the woman is very pale and wearing kind of a large amount of makeup, uh, as though she is attempting to conceal what her true skin looks like beneath. She says, Please, allow me to introduce myself. I believe you are friends of my husband. She says, I am Lady Wolfa. Pom, pom, pom. Let's see how many of you remember who Lady Wolfa is. Yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. All right. Is that the raven from the dream? Everybody make me a history roll and see who gets it. Because I'll tell, I'll tell people who it is. But Any of the highest roll, the, uh, the honor of being the one who remembers what the hell this is. Twelve. I wasn't doing anything. Four. All right. Ariance, you, uh, you think for a moment about a letter that you guys all intercepted quite a long time ago. Um, oh, shit. Oh, oh shit. Like way the hell back? <laughs> yeah. Back in the Battle of Southmore, uh, a letter was intercepted. Uh, from one General Agos, addressed to none other than Mistress Wolfa, uh, the wife of Todd Malakani. So yeah, we'll pick up next time with uh, see what Mistress Wolfa wants with you guys. Erin just has the biggest smirk on her face right now. What did they trade that letter for? <laughs> we traded it for something. What was it? Somebody, uh, somebody was like, "Give me something crazy." And yeah, well, I think it was one of the merchants in like Sickle or something. You guys traded the letter away to. I wish I could remember what we traded it for. Yeah, seems that information is valuable across the plains. Wow. Well, Aaron is chokes back a snicker and and uh, uses the uh, mental channel to tell everybody who she is. I instinctively like pass where she had the letter and finds that it is indeed gone. I think Toham was still stupid when we got this letter. Oh, I don't remember. Well, so yes, Dave, to answer your question, that's that's a good spot to cut it. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I think that one went pretty well. I uh <laughs> And again, I overprepped as a DM because I was like, I don't know how much stuff they're going to go through or how fast they're going to kill all these fucking slimes or if they're just going to be like, fuck these slimes and run. So this was actually going to be your guys' second encounter, possibly, depending on how things go with Mr. Wolfa. And then I got a whole big thing after that. So oh, I don't have to prep this week. Yay. <laughs> Sweet. All right. We're, so uh, hopefully I'll see everybody on Sunday. Next Sunday. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, happy Dad's Day because I won't see you before then. Because then next Sunday is Dad's Day. So yeah, I think Sunday is Dad's Day. Yeah.
Are you doing anything, Nick? Are you going to be able to make it, or you got stuff going on? I mean, I'm, I'll be working. Like, I work every fucking Father's Day, so... Oh, that's true, yeah, so you might not get out till late. Yeah, I right. mean, it really depends. Like, if it rains, we'll get our dick kicked in. Yeah. Like, and if it's nice out, it might be nothing. Right. Well, we can always play it by ear. Hopefully we can get a crew together, and if not, then... I don't know, if anybody does want to play stuff, uh, I've got other games... Like Hero Quest and shit. If you ever go on Tabletop Simulator on Steam, I don't know how many of you guys have Steam, but it's literally like 40,000 board games. So. Oh, I, I have Steam. Yeah. Um, you should put Tabletop Simulator on your wish list, and then when it goes on sale for like $10, you should buy it. Because then, it, yeah, then you can play board games with me. <laughs> Oh, no doubt. I'll, I'll keep super, an eye out for that. Yeah, it's $20 not on sale, so it's like, it's not a super expensive game. It came out in like 2014 or something. Oh, a little, I'm a little short on cash right now, but not. No, I hear it that. won't be the same in the future, so I, I probably in the next few weeks I'll be able to just grab it. Um, Whether it's 20 bucks or not. The other thing is, is that at the end of this month, uh, here's, here's our big announcement for this week, I guess. Um, at the end of this month, my Kickstarter pledge should go active for a thing called Scene Grinder that I did like a month or two ago. Um, Scene Grinder is a new virtual tabletop that's all browser-based, which means that anybody that can access any web browser should theoretically be able to play the way that this like tabletop simulator is intended. So like each of us can control our own character and stuff. And it's supposed to be oh, mo mobile-friendly. It's supposed to have really great development features so you can like program in your character it's sort of like a best of all worlds looking thing and i was sold on it enough that i was like you know what i'm gonna i'll give you guys some money for this and get a lifetime subscription thing for it so like if it turns out as good half as good as it looks on the facebook page then our D, &D game might be getting an upgrade at the end of the month that's cool yeah yeah i was looking for something cool. on like the oculus or whatever for uh D and D, but it's it's kind of limited right now. Yeah, there is there is one that's like the RPG Tavern or something like that. I don't remember what the hell it's called because I downloaded it, and it's cool because it is what it says it is. It's like it's just like having a bunch of miniatures in front of you, so you're still responsible for all of the other crap. And I'm like, how the hell do you read a book in this? There's no way I puke. Yeah. <laughs> if I had to pick up a book and try to thumb through it and read instructions, I'd probably throw up. It would not be good. I was gonna say, I, I I think eventually there might be like some cool stuff on there, but yeah. it's not it's not there yet. There is a uh, there is a game called Dimio or Dimio as well, but that's more like a uh, it's like a board game kind of RPG. So it's more something similar to like if you're playing like one of the like Hero Quest or like an adventure system game or something like that. Still looks cool, but it's I don't know how they're gonna do it being in VR. It seems kind of weird to play a board game in VR. Uh, word. So hopefully I will see everybody next Sunday, and if not, then everybody have a good uh, dance day. All right. You too, man. Awesome. Good game, everybody. Have a good night. Yeah, good game. Good night. All right, see y'all.